all right, all right. I'll finally talk about T-Rex. Ask anyone, and I mean literally anyone, if they've ever heard of T-Rex, and I would put money on the 0% chance that they would say, T-Rex, never heard of him. And I'm sure a lot of paleontologists would agree that T-Rex is severely overhyped, and I do get the whole T-Rex fatigue. But if you take away all of that fame and hype and pretend no one's ever heard of it, this is still a pretty incredible animal, so let's get into why. Tyrannosaurus is a genus that was first discovered in Wyoming in 1900 by the now famous Barnum Brown, when he found a partial skeleton within the Hell Creek Formation, followed by another two years later. It was then described in 1905 by Henry Fairfield Osborne, who named it Tyrannosaurus rex, the Tyrant Lizard King. At the time, only partial remains of the lower jaw, a few vertebrae, limb bones, and parts of the pelvis were known, so the skull looked a lot more allosaurid. It sounds crazy considering how much we know about it today, but this was how we saw T-Rex right up until the 1960s, since wars and economic depressions meant that finding dinosaurs wasn't exactly a priority. It wasn't until the 1960s that renewed interest meant that a whopping 42 skeletons were recovered making paleontologists realise that this wasn't just an excessively big but otherwise generic theropod. So what made it so weird? Well, T-Rex's appearance is one of the few that not many need reminding of. With huge powerful legs, tiny two-fingered arms, and a massive robust skull with banana-sized bone-crushing teeth, and a skull that was weirdly box-shaped from top view. It was also up to 12.5 metres or nearly 41 feet long, 4 metres or 13 feet tall at the hips, and weighed in at just under eight and a half tons, making this not the longest, but almost certainly the heaviest predatory dinosaur based on most estimates. Next we have what many people associate with T-Rex, and that is that poor guy's tiny arms. I don't actually know why. Yes, this guy does have comically short arms, but when compared to other theropods, they're not that bad. I'm looking at you, Carnotaurus and Mononychus. Plus, those guns were no joke being likely able to bicep curl nearly 200 kilograms or 440 pounds on each arm. Moving along, we hit that massive skull. Now, since T-Rex is the single most recognizable and known dinosaur to, well, everyone, there's a preconceived notion that isn't helped by media that T-Rex is the standard for theropods, albeit larger. But I cannot overestimate how weird T-Rex was when compared to other theropods hell how weird it was compared to other tyrannosaurs. The most noticeable difference is this skull. Put it next to the skull of any other theropod and you'll see what I mean. The nasal bone is slightly more concave than others and the entire skull behind the antorbital fenestra is hugely robust and box shaped, with the maxilla region also being very thick, wide and u-shaped rather than v-shaped. The teeth within those jaws were also quite weird. Most theropods teeth are serrated blades ideal for meat slicing but with T-Rex, the teeth were incredibly thick and almost D-shaped in cross-section. As in the, the letter D, not the D, never mind. Basically, despite being pointy and capable of piercing flesh, these bad boys were made for mashing up bone. The jaws were certainly strong enough too. Mechanical and structural analysis have given T-Rex a bite force estimate of around 57,000 newtons, or just under 13,000 pounds. That's a bite force just shy of six tons which also gives T-Rex the title for the strongest bite force of any terrestrial animal in history. Moving slightly away from the bitey parts, turns out T-Rex had lips. You wouldn't have been able to see the teeth when the animal's mouth was closed, and we know this thanks to tiny holes that existed on the jaws just above the teeth called foramina, which serves as anchor points for lips on squamates such as monitor lizards. On top of this, the enamel on the outside of T-Rex's teeth showed no significant wear as opposed to crocodilians with their exposed teeth, where they get a lot of wear on the outside. A T-Rex wasn't able to move those lips, so couldn't pucker up for a Frenchie, but they were present as they likely were in all theropods. Then we see why the eyes are so interesting. Now remember that box-shaped skull that I keep harpering on about? Well, that shape was partly there to accommodate the very clever eye placement. Depth perception is something that I think we take for granted. It's a feature that's quite common in mammals, especially ones that hunt, and is achieved by having forward-facing eyes that are able to focus on the same point simultaneously. Not many theropods actually had this, and if they did, it was quite limited. 
They'd have to turn their head slightly to the side to focus at you with one eye. And this lack of depth perception means that things that are completely still stand out less if the animal isn't moving towards it. Hence the common misconception from Jurassic Park of... Can't see us if we don't move. Theropods like this weren't completely blind to still objects. It's just they didn't pay much attention if it wasn't moving. They would still eat you. Because, you know, sound and smell were still a thing. T-Rex, on the other hand, had forward facing eyes with binocular capabilities on par with humans. In fact, paleontologists estimate that this thing could see better than a hawk. In fact, it could probably see things three times further away than a human can, making out objects up to 3.7 miles away. If you stood still, it would stop, tilt its head in curiosity as to why an animal would be so stupid not to run, then decide it doesn't really care and chomp down on you like a drunk 22 year old on a kebab made of mystery meat. Which brings us very neatly onto the brain. Well, T-Rex was basically daredevil with better eyesight. CT scans of the brain case of this dinosaur has shed light on many things. For a start, it had an unusually long cochlea, which is the inner part of the ear, meaning that hearing was an essential part of its lifestyle. Its hearing range was at its peak in low frequencies, which means that either its prey gave off low frequency sounds, or it could use this to hear communications from other Tyrannosauruses from miles away. As for what kind of sound that was, that is something that I've recreated in a video that you can listen to here. On top of this, its senses were further heightened through very sensitive snouts. Sensory neurons similar to those of crocodiles have been found in T-Rex snouts and other relatives that show there wasn't much they couldn't pick up on through feeling with their snout alone. From measuring the temperature of nests to being more accurate with their bites, even being as gentle as possible with those giant gnashes to carry eggs or even live young. It was even speculated in Prehistoric Planet that they used that sensitivity during courtship. This last one has particular support since this neurosensitivity increased as an ontogenetic feature, meaning it increased as the animal reached adulthood. Overall, this would have greatly increased T-Rex's ability for fine motor movements, similar to all of the things that we can do with our hands when compared to other mammals. Then we have that sense of smell, which has birthed one of the more famous T-Rex debates. Now again, these CT scans showed that T-Rex had a weirdly large olfactory bowl, which meant that its sense of smell was actually greater than a vulture's. This sense of smell is strangely acute for a predator, bringing forward the idea from Jack Horner that T-Rex was a scavenger, being able to detect carcasses from miles away and using its size to bully anything else away from that carcass. This was further supported by the bone crushing teeth since you can get more nutrition than you can just meat alone but this theory does have some issues that I'll get into in just a sec. Overall, brain studies of T-Rex found that on top of those acute senses, T-Rex was up there in terms of intelligence with the ranks of Ornithomimus, Bambi Raptor, and Troodon. Now, before I get into that scavenging debate, I just want to put another one to bed. Was T-Rex feathered? Now, T-Rex was a Silurosaur, being one of the closer groups to birds than most other theropods, and feathers have been found to be an ancestral trait to this group. In other words, when you don't have direct evidence of skin covering with a Silurosaur, it's safe to assume that it likely had feathers to some degree. But there are some exceptions to that rule. Skin impressions have been found from T-Rex, all from a variety of places around the body, from leg to tail to belly to back. Now these are small impressions, but clear enough and with enough distribution throughout the body to show that it was mostly scaly. Yep, no fluffy T-Rex, at least as an adult, which means if I was a betting man, I would have definitely lost money. But I will say this, the skin impressions did have a wide distribution, but they were very small. On top of that, ancestral traits don't go away all that easily. Even whales and dolphins have some tiny strands of hair if you look close enough. So maybe it had a few quills on its back that wouldn't have been noticeable unless you were up close. In which case, the T-Rex from the prologue of Jurassic World Dominion was the most accurate with regards to integument. Next up, was it a scavenger? No. Good night. Now by now you guys know that I don't really commit to theories wholeheartedly often, but to me T-Rex had way too many tools for predation. Such as the binocular vision, powerful hind legs, recurved teeth to help snag struggling prey, which wouldn't be struggling if it was, you know, dead. And the fact that being a scavenger means you can't just sit around and wait for something to drop dead in front of you. You've got to cover some miles. An animal this big would likely burn way more calories than it could consume from a carcass that might have been picked on for a while before that. 
This was all truly put to bed though when fossils of Edmontosaurus and Triceratops were found to have bite wounds from a T-Rex that uh, healed over to some degree, meaning it was not only alive when it was attacked, but also survived the encounter. Having said that, predation and scavenging are not usually two exclusive things. Many scavengers will pick up a live meal every now and then if it's easy enough, and most predators wouldn't turn their nose up at a free meal that's already dead in front of them. So T-Rex, like most carnivores, probably did both. Now I hope that this explains just a little bit how T-Rex is legitimately an awesome animal and it's not just all hype. The group of tyrannosaurs are an extraordinarily diverse group of theropods, but if you take a look at most other tyrannosaurs, you'll see that T-Rex isn't just weird for a dinosaur, it's weird for a tyrannosaur. Most other tyrannosaurs are nowhere near as big and robust. They don't have such derived skulls, have more ornamentation on those skulls, are normally a lot more leggy, and many even have three-fingered claws. T-Rex was a weirdo. It also turns out that this might represent more than one weirdo. In January of 2022, a paper was published proposing a re-evaluation of the Tyrannosaurus genus. They found that the robustness of certain features such as the femur and cranial bones actually correlate with both dental and chronological differences of certain specimens and said that this was enough to split Tyrannosaurus into three distinct species. Tyrannosaurus rex, Tyrannosaurus regina, and Tyrannosaurus imperator, meaning the tyrant lizards king, queen, and emperor. With T. regina being the smallest and most gracile, T. rex being somewhere in the middle, and T. imperator being the biggest. Now obviously this has been met with enough argument that this isn't the new status quo. Namely because many people think that these differences are questionable, and the fact that three apex predators of this kind of magnitude simply couldn't exist in an environment together. But to be fair, the authors have argued that each species transitioned into another rather than existing all simultaneously, which is known as anagenesis. So how exactly did it exercise all of these characteristics? What kind of environment did it live in? Well, this video has gone on long enough, but I just so happened to be going over quite a few critters from the same formation, so I thought, why not just do a video on it? Now, if you subscribe if you haven't already, then you'll be notified of when I bring that video out next week. But until then, I'll catch you guys next time.